And good morning to all of our guests. We're so glad to have you this morning. You are an honored guest. We are involved in a sermon series on maturity, Christian maturity. Last year, we had each lesson dealing with fundamentals, building blocks of our faith. But this year, we're trying to build on that by talking about Christian maturity. And as we began this year, we talked about the book of James. James is written for that very purpose, to tell Christians that are struggling in their faith to count all joy when you have those spiritual trials in your life, knowing the trying of your faith worketh Christian maturity. And after talking about the faith, then we saw from 1 Peter the hope to hold on to. Remember who you are and who he is in your life. And 1 Peter 5 and verse 7, casting all of your care upon him because he cares for you. Today we look at the book of 2 Peter. And as we do, I thought about those two authors, James, the author there, the half-brother of our Lord Jesus Christ, didn't even believe in Jesus when he walked the earth until after the resurrection. And then here is Peter who has a roller coaster life. He really can talk to you about maturing in the faith because he really had a struggle with that. If you remember last Sunday night, I mentioned to you that there is even a word for that. Now, I'm not sure I, I hear it used very often today. It's still in your dictionary. You heard the term petering or petering out? It means to decrease or fade before the end. Like somebody running a race, just before the finish line, they just peter out. They just don't finish. Well, they get that from Peter's life. And you can surely see it in the Bible. For instance, in Matthew chapter 16, verses 13 to 16, Jesus is asking the apostles, who am I? And Peter says, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus is so enamored by that because he said, flesh and blood didn't tell you that. I mean, nobody's gotten it yet, but you finally got it from my Father in heaven. And you are Simon Barjona. That's what he was called when Jesus first met him in John chapter 1, Simon's son of Jonah. And I think that's in his mind when he writes in 2 Peter chapter 1, Simon Peter, what he was before because he says, you are Peter. You're, you're, you're getting it. And upon the bedrock fact you just gave, I'm the Christ, I'm going to build my church and give you the keys to it. But would you believe that same Peter that said that just a few months or a year later? The Lord looked at him in Luke 22, verses 32 and 33, and says, Satan wants to sift you like wheat. But I've been praying for you that your faith doesn't fail. And when you're converted, strengthen the brethren. What do you mean when I'm converted? I mean, I left all to follow you, Lord, and I walked on the water with you. Oh, by the way, in Matthew chapter 14, Peter did walk on the water with Jesus, the only man to walk on the water. However, what happened? He petered out. He began to sink, and Jesus grabbed him and pulled him out of the drink and said, Oh, thou of little faith, why did you doubt? And then Jesus is talking about that night in which he was telling all the apostles in Matthew 26 that you're all going to deny me. And what did Peter say? I will never deny you. Right. In the same chapter, he peters out and does it three times. And Christ said he would do that. And right in the middle of that chapter, Jesus had taken the apostles to the garden, just three, Peter, James, and John, a little further with him, and said, just wait here and watch as I pray, and you pray also. But when he came back, he found them asleep. He petered out. He said, couldn't you wait for me an hour? So we saw last Sunday night from 1 Peter chapter 5, Peter says, don't be like me, be faithful. Don't be like me so proud and have to eat humble pie. Be humble. And number three, be watchful. Well, as we begin now in 2 Peter chapter 1, I invite you to open your Bibles if you haven't already, and I want you to look at this text with me, and we'll begin reading at verse 1. 2 Peter chapter 1 and verse 1. Simon Peter, and he finally got it. 
even though he mentions he's an apostle, but notice the order. I am a servant. That's most important. And James said the very same thing. Being a half-brother of Christ, more important is be a servant of Christ. A servant and an apostle of Jesus Christ, to them obtained a like precious faith. Now, what's he talking about? Go over to verse 12 with me for a minute. Notice this, this point here. He says, Wherefore, I will not be negligent to put you always in remembrance of these things, though you know them, and be established in the present truth. You've already heard it. You already know it. But I'm going to remind you of it again. Why? Yea, I think it right, as long as I'm in this tabernacle, in this body, to stir you up by putting you in remembrance, knowing that shortly I must put off my tabernacle or body, even as our Lord Jesus Christ has showed me. Would you believe I was in an elders' preacher's meeting one time, and an elder was kind of questioning my preaching. I have always ears to hear, uh, but his point was this. He says, don't you think this congregation knows their Bible? And I was hoping some of the other elders, he was a newer elder, would remind them the reason they hired me. They hired me to preach the Word, to preach the Bible. He wanted me to tell stories. He didn't last very long in the eldership. But my point is this. Peter says the ministry that we have is to constantly remind ourselves of things that we might have already heard and already know that we might keep doing it. All right? Now, he reminds us here in chapter 1 and verse 1, did you know this? That whether you've been baptized a few weeks or you've been in the church all your life, baptized when you're 10 years old like I was and been in the church all your life, we all have the same precious faith even as the apostles. Does that make you feel better now? Wow, and how blessed you are. We have a like precious faith. And so the first thing he's going to do today is to remind us of what God has done for us in the past. He's provided this like precious faith that you and I can be a part of today. He also says, through the righteousness of God and our Savior Jesus Christ. It's not because I'm right, it's because he's right. But when I do what he says, he makes me right in him. So in verse 2, grace and peace be multiplied unto you through the knowledge of God and Jesus our Lord. Let me tell you something. This book is going to really emphasize the importance of biblical knowledge. Not just book knowledge, but knowing him. Do you know the author of this book? I mean God. Do you know God? Paul said in 2 Timothy 1 and verse 12, I know who I believe in. Not just believe in him, I know who I believe in. And I'm persuaded that he's able to keep what I've committed to him against that day. I know him. Paul said in Philippians chapter 3, I want to know him, the power of his resurrection, being conformed at his death, that I might be a part of this resurrection. To know him. How do you know anybody? Well, communication. How does God speak to me? Through the Word. He's talking to me when I read that Word. How do I talk to Him? Through prayer. And then I put the two together and I try to live that life. And as I try to live that life, I know He's there. I know He cares. I know He's helped me through it. So I know who I believe in. Then in verse 3, another great thought here. According as His divine power hath given to us all things obtained to life and godliness through the knowledge of Him, and then he says in verse 4, whereby are given to us exceeding great and precious promises. Not only do we have a like precious faith, but we have precious promises that God's already given us. The reason why God sent Jesus into this world was to save you and save me. And Christ, the way to do that was to live the perfect life and die the most hideous death man's ever devised, crucifixion, and be raised the third day for your sins and mine. The gospel is 1 Corinthians 15, 1 to 4, the death and the burial and the resurrection of Christ. 
And then he gave us the plan that you and I can reenact that when we're baptized, Romans 6 says. You are buried with him in baptism. You only bury dead things. You died to your sins. You're buried in a watery grave, and you're raised to walk in a newness of life. That's the plan. But how do I get there? In John 8 and verse 24, you will die in your sins. If you don't believe I am he, you will die in your sins. You have to believe in him. You have to repent of your past sins, Luke 13 and verse 3. Except you repent, shall all likewise perish. You have to confess him as the Son of God in your life, Matthew 10 and verse 32. I believe Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Christ said, if, I, if you, you confess me, I'll confess you before the Father in heaven. And then, notice, I've got to do those things, but then I be baptized. It's something that's done to me. I submit to his plan of being baptized die, bury, and raise to walk in the newness of life, and then strive to live the Christian life. That plan is for everyone, and that plan is precious. And the power of it, his divine power, he talks about in verse 3, the power of salvation. And then number two, we get Jesus. In John chapter 14, the Bible says, Christ says, when you obey the gospel, Galatians 3, 26 and 27, when you're baptized into Christ, you put me on. I actually come into your life. The Father comes into your life. But also the Bible tells us that the Holy Spirit comes into our life. In Acts 2 and verse 38, when you're baptized into Christ, you receive the Holy Spirit as a gift in your life, a power you didn't have before, a power so wonderful. In Ephesians 3 and verse 16, we are strengthened by his spirit in the inner man. A lot of folks tell me, well, the guy, let me get my life all straightened up, then I'll be baptized. If you could do that, you wouldn't need the Holy Spirit. You wouldn't need the Lord. You can't do it, folks. You have to die to yourselves, have his come into your life, your sins washed away, and then he gives you the strength to keep on keeping on. You have the Holy Spirit in your life. And then prayer. The power of prayer, the most powerful thing in the universe is between your two hands. You can even change God's mind. Read the book of Jonah. And then the Bible. Have the Bible, the Word of God, to talk to us every day on how to live this life. Psalm 119, 105, thy word's a lamp to my feet and a light to my pathway. And then to have Christ's blood. When you are baptized into Christ, Romans 6 says, you're baptized into his death. John 19, 33 to 35 say, says that Jesus shed his blood in his death. So when you're baptized into his death, you're baptized into his blood. And that's what washes away your sins initially. But then every day as you live the Christian life and you pray for forgiveness, 1 John 1 and verse 7 and verse 9, if we walk in the light as he's in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and his blood, what? Keeps on cleansing our sins in the original. And in verse 9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. The blood of Christ. There's power in the blood. And then heaven itself. Titus 1 and verse 2, in hope of eternal life, which God who cannot lie promise for the world was. Whenever you get down in the dumps, you remember what the Lord has given us in the past. Salvation, Jesus, the Holy Spirit, prayer, Bible, Christ's blood, heaven, the church family. We go on and on and on. But second of all, remember what God has done for us in the present. He says here in verse 4, has given to us, seeing great and precious promises, that you might, by these, you might be partakers of the divine nature. Now, what is that? I just explained it to you, but here it is again. When you obey the gospel, you die to yourself. You leave your old life in the baptistry, and you rise to walk in a newness of life with the deity in you. You have a divine nature now. Someone asked, what happens when I'm baptized? What's going to change in my life? If you die like you're supposed to, everything changed. He even changed your name to Christian. But Galatians 2.20, Paul says, I have been crucified with Christ. I died with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. It's not me living. It's Christ living in me. 
The life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Now be honest with yourselves. Do people see you as a Christian at your work, at school, at home, your neighborhood? Do they see the difference? Do they see Christ in you? That's the divine nature. In chapter 4 and verse 19, my work here, Paul says, I labor with you as a woman under labor pains until Christ be formed in you. That's the whole concept of ministry. And in Galatians 6, verses 1 and 2, the Apostle Paul says, If any of you be overtaken in a fault, you that are spiritual, you become spiritual by growing in the nature of our Lord. Restore such a one in a spirit of meekness, lest you also be tempted, and bear ye one another's burdens, and so fulfill the law of Christ. So in Acts 11, 26, these group of people were first called Christ-likeians, Christians at Antioch. A divine, they saw it, and he recognized it. Then in our text here, once you're baptized, then what? Well, here's something for you. You add to your initial faith that brought you into Christ through obedience of faith and baptism, these Christian virtues. Where are you on this scale? Look at our verse right here, verse 5. Besides this, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue. What does the word virtue mean? It means moral excellence. That's what it actually means. You hear people say, our product is excellent. You want to strive for excellence. Strive for moral excellence. Be a good moral person. There's a lot of good moral people in this world. But you are because you're following the Christ. But how do you do that? Add to that moral virtue, knowledge. What would Jesus do? The Bible tells us. And we try to reenact that in our lives. Knowledge. And then knowledge, self-control. Get ourselves to act in any situation the way Jesus would act. Have our passions in control. This is talking about Christian maturity, self-control. And to self-control, perseverance, patience, keep on keeping on. And to patience, God-likeness in my life. And to God-likeness, brotherly kindness, loving one another. 1 John 4, 7 and 8. Beloved, let us love one another. For love is of God. And everyone that loveth is born of God knoweth God. He that loveth not knoweth not God, for God is love. And then the last one, godly love in my life, agape. Now, these things are to be added to us. Now look at verse 8 with me. Big word here, the second word in. For application, if, if these things be in you. Okay, they are. And abound. They're supposed to abound. They make you that you shall neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Did you know that once you obey the gospel, you're supposed to bear fruit? Well, in what way? Well, there's a number of ways. Let me mention a couple of them for you. Did you know that when you are baptized into Christ, you're supposed to bear the fruit of the Spirit in your life? Galatians 5, 22 and 23. And the fruit of the Spirit is godly love and joy and peace. And these, these concepts we talked about here in our lives. But not only that, but in Colossians 1 and verse 10, it ought to motivate us to put it to action, to work. Our works are fruit, Paul says. Not only our works, but even sharing it with others. Romans 1 and verse 13, Paul says, I want to have some fruit among you. Talking about converts to the faith. Do you have any fruit like that in your life? Do you have a prospect list of people you might bring to the faith to bear fruit in that way? And then there's the fruit of the Spirit. In Hebrews 13 and verse 15, the fruit of my lips giving praise to his name, sharing him, the way I talk, the way I live. And then the fruit of the Spirit in our lives of 
giving. In Romans 15 and verse 26, Paul says, I'm going to give this contribution, this fruit, and then I'll come and see you. There's all kinds of fruit that we can bear for the Lord. And he wants us to do that. Now, if these things abound in you, you won't be barren or unfruitful in the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. But what if they're not? But he that lacketh these things is blind. And I'm going to tell you, you can show some people the words, God's word. They say, I don't see it. It's in black and white. But they don't see it because Satan has blinded their eyes. And nearsighted. They're only thinking of themselves, not thinking about their future. And they have spiritual amnesia. They've forgotten what the Lord has done for them who bought them. You don't want that. But the other is also true. If they do abound in you, then you can see. Oh, I see what God's Word says. And I see the, the, the future, the visionary process He has for me and the future I have in Him. And I remember what Jesus has done for me. So verse 10, Wherefore the rather, brethren, give diligence to make your calling and election sure. For if you do these things, you shall never fall. I believe, and we have all of our hearts, that this book teaches this, I'll see it here tonight in a, in a marvelous way, but the doctrine that so many people teach in the religious world is once saved, always saved. And that's not true. In fact, this whole book is warning. That's why he said, I want to call you to remembrance, lest you forget and fall. But in so doing that, I think we might have emphasized that to the point where people don't have any security. And that's not true either. It's not once saved, always saved, but it's not once saved, never saved. If you're saved, you're saved. That's what he says here. Wherefore, the rather, brethren, give diligence to make your calling and election sure. You need to be sure of your faith and sure of your salvation. And if you're not, do so today. Be sure that you're going to heaven. Make your calling election sure. For if you do these things, he's been talking about, you're not going to stumble. You're going to be in the right path, going the right direction, in the right way. For so an entrance shall be supplied unto you into the everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So remember what God will do for us in the future. He supplies this entrance. Let me show you something real quickly. Turn over the book of Jude. Second Peter and Jude, especially chapter 2 of Second Peter, are divine commentary on each other. Now, I'll talk about more tonight. But look at these last couple of verses, verse 23 and 24. That's 24 and 25 of Jude. And listen to this carefully, brethren. If this morning you have a doubt about your salvation, listen to what Jude says. Now unto him that is able to do what? To keep you from falling. In John 10, verses 23 and following, Jesus is talking. He says, if we are in his hand, no one can pluck it out. That's fact. Nobody can take you out of God's hand. The only way you can get out of God's hand is if you walk away from him. 2 Peter 2 talks about them walking away from it like a hog and a dog. But if you stay in his hand, if you walk in his way, he will keep you from falling and present you faultless. I'm not faultless, Lord. Yes, you are. When you've been obeyed the gospel and had that blood wash away your sins, and when you're walking in the light of his word every day, and whenever you die, when I meet him in judgment, he opens the book of life, and he says, there's no sins recorded here. They've been washed in my son's blood. Enter in, thou good and faithful servant. Faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. Enter the joy of your Lord. To the only wise God, our Savior, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and forever. Amen. That means so be it. So, moving on to maturity, what God has done for us in the past, a like precious faith. In the present, we now have a divine 
nature. And in the future, heaven. Now, you can't beat that, folks. This morning, if that's not you, it can be you this morning. You can come down the aisle, give me your hand and God your heart. We'll baptize you into Christ, have all your sins washed away, and then you walking in this light of his word on to Christian maturity, adding to your faith each day these Christian graces and bringing others to the faith. If you've already been baptized into Christ, but now I've been living the life, you're not on this road at all. Get back on that road this morning. This is the only way. Christ says, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no man comes to the Father but by me. You can come forward this morning, and we'll pray with you and for you to have that as your life. Christian maturity, growing in the faith. Will you come?